Number 12 Prisoner of War and Internment Group was built at Cowra in 1941. It was no different from any of the other POW camps scattered around Australia. It followed the same dull routine day after day, week after week, year after year. Except one day something happened there which became part of local and national history. The war came to Cowra. The Cowra breakout on the 5th of August 1944 ended with the deaths of 234 Japanese and five Australians and the destruction of 21 buildings by fire. Why did this happen? The Cowra camp at central New South Wales was officially known as number 12 prisoner of war and internment group. There were four separate compounds. A and C were for Italians, B for Japanese, and D, which was separated into three areas, was for Japanese officers, Koreans and Chinese who were part of the Japanese forces, and Italian fascists. The camp commenced operation in June 1941, firstly with Italian civilian internees who were processed and quickly released, and then with Italian prisoners of war from the North African campaigns. With Muzzo's military gearbox stuck in reverse, thousands of his troops finished their high-speed retreat down the gangplank of a troop ship in Australia. As they head for a Commonwealth internment camp, each man is issued with an army greatcoat dyed red and a tin pannikin. None of the prisoners claims to be fascist. An Italian officer described them as King's men. OK, King's men, but you're just a lot of black shirts to us. Anyway, they'll have plenty of time behind the barbed wire to think the whole thing over. Maybe they'll discover they belong to the Aussies for the duration. The Italians were generally well behaved and were put to work cutting wood for fuel and working on local farms. They were well liked around Cowra and would throw small gifts to the local children as they drove out on work parties. Inside their compounds, they grew vegetables, made handcrafts, and even taught local Cowra builders new skills. There were many talented singers and musicians, and they performed plays and Italian operettas. A small but dangerous group of Italian blackshirt fascists were kept separately under guard in D compound. An unusual group of Javanese sailors, as well as Indonesian political prisoners and their families, were also interned at Kaura. They were brought to Australia after the Japanese invaded Dutch Indonesia, but were soon released when it was realised that they posed no threat. In 1943, the tide was turning against the Japanese. Australian and US forces pushed them back along the Kokoda Trail and many prisoners were taken. They were starving and suffering from tropical disease, but after capture, they were fed and given the same medical treatment as the Australian troops. Jap wounded left to die by their comrades are brought in by Australians out on patrol. These are sidelights from the Owen Stanley mountain area. By driving the Japs out of the gap, down to the plains and back to the sea at Boona, the immediate threat of a battle for Australia was averted. Patrols have to move cautiously because isolated parties of Japanese are still resisting and have to be mopped up. Some of the hardest fighting was experienced here. They were sent to Brisbane for interrogation and then to Cowra. When they arrived, they were sullen and difficult to manage. They had not been taught how to behave as prisoners of war. In fact, they were greatly ashamed of being taken captive and were looking for a way to regain their honour. This opportunity arose on the 4th of August 1944. 
Too many Japanese were now being captured and B compound was dangerously overcrowded. Militant agitators were stirring up trouble. The Australians decided to move 700 lower ranking prisoners to another camp at Hay in western New South Wales. The Japanese compound leaders angrily objected and called a meeting with the representatives from each of the 21 accommodation huts in B compound. They decided to rise up and riot, to attack the perimeter and die in battle. Private Alf Rolls was on sentry duty in the middle of Broadway. It was 1.45 a.m. An excited Japanese prisoner ran up to the fence near his post. Alf knew something was about to happen. He fired the two required warning shots and ran for his life. Japanese exploded out of their huts with makeshift weapons and headed in three directions. Two groups attacked the northern and eastern compound fences, and another group jumped into Broadway to attack the northern and southern fences. Alf Rolls made it to the southern gate just in time. The security fences were only six feet high and had not been increased after a security scare the previous year. Privates Jones and Hardy ran to their machine gun and opened fire, but were soon overwhelmed and killed. Years later, they would each be awarded a posthumous George Cross. After just 20 minutes, over 180 Japanese were dead. Their weapons were removed and the wounded were treated. 300 escaped into the Kaura countryside. It would take nine days to round them up and in the process, two more Australian soldiers would die. Some Japanese killed themselves alone in the Australian bush. Two were shot by a Kaura farmer, but others were given food by Australian families. At the end, 234 Japanese and five Australians were dead. This was the tragedy of the Kaura breakout. This terrible loss of life came about because of a clash of cultures in wartime. With better understanding and discipline, it need not have happened. Since that dark time, Kaura and Japan have worked hard for reconciliation and now have an enduring friendship. This came about due to the early efforts of a group of Kaura returned servicemen who cared for the overgrown Japanese graves. As a result, the Japanese government created a new cemetery at Kaura, where the remains of all Japanese who died in Australia during World War II are now interred. A great deal has taken place in Kaura since the war years. The beautiful Japanese gardens and cultural centre was planned and developed by a group of dedicated Kaura citizens and its imagery and design combines traditional Japanese components with the broad Australian landscape. The designer Ken Nakajima wanted it to be a place where the souls of the Japanese could find peace and it has become a physical expression of the bond between Kaura and Japan. Kaura recognises the importance of its history and has respectfully commemorated the Kaura breakout on significant anniversaries, with many Australian and Japanese visitors attending the memorial events. A student exchange with Seikei High School in Tokyo and Kaura High School has been in continuous operation since 1970, together with other high school and cultural exchanges between Kaura and Japan. A festival of international understanding has been held in Kaura for over 50 years. Kaura Council developed a friendship agreement with Joetsu City, Japan, where Australian POWs were held in World War II. In 1992, Australia's World Peace Bell was awarded to Kaura for its work in peace and reconciliation. This presentation is dedicated to all those who have worked for reconciliation between Australia and Japan and who have succeeded in producing a lasting friendship in the aftermath of tragedy. Such is the legacy of the Kaura breakout. The winding stream flows on and knows not to what it flows. And on the surface float the fallen leaves of autumn. They, too, are swept on, unknowing, 